Okay, can we go? Okay. Uh, buenas noches. Eh, soy el doctor Ricardo Ash eh, del Colegio de Reproducción Asistida de México y tengo el honor de participar en este webinar con la doctora Uliana Dorieva de Ucrania, de Kiev, con quien hemos establecido una relación muy, muy eh, buena, académica, científica, y eh, hemos decidido armar un webinar sobre eh, embarazos o fertilidad después de la edad de 40 años. Este webinar va a ser en inglés. Entonces yo en este momento voy a cambiarme, voy a poner otro tipo de sombrero y voy a empezar a hablar en inglés. Uh, what I just said, Uliana, is that it is a tremendous pleasure for us to have you. Uh, I introduce you. I told them who you are. Uh, and that the topic of the webinar that you recommended us that we do was pregnancy after the age of 40, the variables, the possibilities, the different approaches, and, and I think it's a fantastic topic. Uh, many people in the Colegio de Reproducción Asistida de México are very interested in this topic. And, and in Mexico, this topic is at full explosion now. Uh, I promise that I will intervene the little as possible to let you do your full lecture as much as, as you will. But I would like to say a few words before we start and we let you go on with your talk. Uh, the, the effect of aging on reproductive efficiency has been a topic of articles, lectures, for many, 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 many years. Uh, I have been giving lectures on this, I would think, easy for about 30 years. Now, to me, the important thing when we are talking about aging is try to understand what are the variables that determines the positivity or the likelihood of a pregnancy based on aging. And I have divided them in at least, and I'm sure there are many more, seven variables that are crucial for the efficiency of reproduction in the human. Talking specifically on women and not on men. The first variable is a hormonal variable. And when you look at the hormonal values of the two main hormones that determine efficiency of fertility, one will be uh, anti-Mullerian hormone, the other one will be FSH and estradiol. Now, if you do a complete research on those two, three hormones, along the age of women across all their life. Of course, there are curves. Some curves will ascend like FSH. Some curves will descend like estradiol. Some curves 
will descend like anti-Mullerian hormone. Now, the important thing on the curves is when the step up or the going down become statistically significant. And with anti-Mullerian hormone, uh, in all the research that has been done, the typical age at which statistically it changes is around 36 to 37 years of age. If you take tau age and estradiol, every, every topic, every year, every month, whatever, over a long period of time, you're going to see that all the articles tell you that at the age of 36 is where the main changes occur. First variable was hormonal. Second variable, number of ovarian follicles that you can you can study that in two different ways. One is like Roger Gosden did by looking at the ovaries and count the number of follicles in women at different ages. And the other one is like we have done and published many times is to see how many eggs can you retrieve from women according to their ages. And in Roger Gosden, classical paper in human reproduction with Fadi, they had a beautiful uh, correlation that the curve is not exactly it's a curve, but it's a two slope uh, uh, curve, if you want to say it, with the midpoint that is where it really happens, the change, is at 37 years. And for us, with collecting eggs uh, with thousands and thousands of women, the first author was uh, Danny Rothstein, now in Chicago, and, and also with the number of eggs, when you collect the, 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 the big statistical differences after the age of 37. Now, pregnancy rates in women, it has been in all the registries, European, American, from the USA, Latin American, all the registries tells you that the pregnancy rates change dramatically after the age of 36. One thing is until a woman is 36. And another thing is that when a woman is after 37. This is the third variable. The fourth variable is the implantation rate. And in the implantation range, Koji and co-workers did a similar study of accounting for the implantation rate on women according to their ages. And you know already what, what all am I saying, what happened, implantation rates change in women in a curve exactly at the age of 37. And the same happened with the pregnancy loss. Warburton and co-workers study the percentage of miscarriages according to the age of women. And that is also increases dramatically after the age of 37. Finally, the genetics that are the genetics of the eggs First one to talk about this was Michel Plachot, that you know very well, I'm sure, that in 1988 was the first one to describe the aneuploidies in women according to age. And that age where she found that started the women to have lots of aneuploidies was after the age of 36.
And finally, the uterine factor that it doesn't appear to have that type of difference according to the age of women. Uh, so my question and my criticism is why in the hell do we talk so much about 40? If we have to pick an age, we should say about 36 or 37 years. Why 40? So that brings to the question, who invented this thing about 40? And I have the answer to you. The first one to talk about pregnancy before and after 40 was Bill Spellacy in 1986, that he wrote an article in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Bill Spellacy in America, uh, Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproduction. And he wrote that article that is about pregnancy after 40 years of age. And then in about 1986, also 1987, the group of Norfolk with Dr. Acosta, Rosenbach, and other people wrote the first article in in vitro fertilization, this dividing the women of their population in those less than 40 and those more than 40. So like all things that we determine exactly uh, arbitrarily something uh, has a history. And I wanted to give a little bit of this history. Now, we know very well that uh, that fertility changes a lot with age. Uh, but we know that now there are many, many women after the age of 40 that want to become pregnant. Uh, and have against them all those variables that I mentioned. According to the SART Statistics Registry of 2020, 20% 20 of all the women in the United States that undergo procedures of assisted reproduction, 20% are above the age of 40. That's a lot of, lot of them. I read one article, a common, simple article uh, in the New York Times that I don't believe is true, but it says that in the United States, more than 100,000 women a year over 40 deliver a child. I don't believe the numbers. They, they don't fit according to the data of the SART registry. But like in any, any registry, as you know, Liana, not everybody reports. Some people report numbers that are invented. So everything is possible. Now, uh, the, the important thing is that Today, we live in a different world. First of all, because women have a completely different life expectancy. Women decide, thank God, their, their decisions of when to have a child on their own many times. They don't even need a partner, or they could have a partner that is from the same gender. And in that group of the LGBTQ+, there are many, many, many women over the age of 40 that are interested in fertility. So I think there is a, a lots of possibilities to 
to, to apply all the knowledge that you will bring to us today in your lecture, Juliana, in, to explaining us why or how women over 40 can have a child. So I finish now. I would like to thank you one more time, Juliana, for your generosity, for your appearance at this time of the day that for you is three in the morning. Uh, and we are all ears and we want to wait anxiously for your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear Professor Ash. And this is my great pleasure. You know, we are all global and we are acting globally and we are trying to live also global life. I could have comments or some messages in early morning, late evening from patients, from our partners, from USA, from Australia. So this is a perfect time when probably like I will not be interrupted by anything. And this is my great pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, I agree that uh, 40 is as a cut line for some patients who have been tried already a lot. And uh, because since they started, we all are talking about 35. But then this, this time between 35 to 40, for some of our patients, this is the time once they started to try of getting pregnant and some of them are getting successful pregnancies and they are not in these um, statistics which we are talking right now. And those patients who are not successful since they started in, in 35, quite many of them, they are still continue until they are over 40. So this is how we are bringing this really complicated group of the patients. So this is probably why we, we talked and why we decided to talk about finally um, over 40. Uh, and I would like to share our experience. And this is more practical experience of how we are helping for the patients who are in their advanced maternal age to achieve a successful pregnancy. So thank you again for everyone who joined us. And this is my great pleasure. So if you are talking about global need, because our patients, we all understand that they can travel and medical tourism is very active right now. We experienced that in Ukraine uh, that was before COVID, and then that was another time before the war started. But in our center, we had over 80% of the patients who were international patients who came into Ukraine for the successful treatment because in their country, mostly, that was not allowed. And Ukraine, everything what is mostly effective for the mm, serious cases for the um, complicated cases for advanced maternal age this was absolutely um, available like an outside donation like surrogacy treatment like an experimental techniques which are considered as a mitochondrial donation so the total number of uh, infertile couples or patients, we would call them better patients, around the globe is uh, 90 million people. This is according to the data. Again, how reliable is this data? But this is a huge number. Not all of them have access for the treatment, of course. Uh, not all of them will be treated during this year. Uh, and the next year, this figure will also grow up, etc. But even five years ago, we were talking about the fact that about 10% of this patients would need an oocyte donation or would be recommended as oocyte donation as a treatment, as an effective treatment for, for their um, infertility. But right now we are talking about 25 to even sometimes to 30% in different countries. This figure may be different because still we have different cultures, but this is true. 
And we will talk why this figure will be even increasing during the, the, the future uh, decade or so. So if we are talking about the goals of the reproduction independently, in which age this patient will step into our door, either she will be 23 or 35 or 49, so our goal is to achieve a pregnancy as soon as possible to maximize the success rate for the first initial cycle of each patient. Many of them, they will come not in their first cycle. And I will show some clinical cases later on, uh, on how many cases patient could have before they will reach the successful pregnancy and what methods they will use. Uh, we need to reduce the multiple pregnancy. Of course, we are talking about single and elective uh, embryo transfer as a rule right now. We need to guarantee the safety in IVF and help or try to help as many patients as possible, understanding the fact that for some we need to reduce the costs, we need to understand their low limits, and we need to use the most effective techniques. For women, our biological clock is always running and every minute we are losing our potential of producing um, an oocyte and healthy oocyte. And the most important, this is happening after 35 years old, as we mentioned already. And this is true that 99.9% .9 of our potential is lost. We started to talk about oocyte cryopreservation just recently, and very limited number of patients could come to us and say, like, I froze my eggs six years ago, 10 years ago, four years ago, and these are the eggs, they are stored here and there. You can, doctor, you can use them for our, for my treatment. Most of these patients, they are just coming with the big amount of papers of their results, reports, previous treatments reports, and with no X or very limited number of the polygols, um, high FSH, low IMH, etc. This is true also that in general, in developed countries, people become to live longer. They are living longer. And while they understand that they are living longer, they are planning their lives. And again, in the developed countries, women started to plan their lives, started to plan their families in around their 35, 40s. They are taking care about how they look like. They are young uh, while they are watching the mirror. But once we are coming uh, to the ultrasound, evaluation, once we are coming to the hormonal profile evaluation, we can clearly see and state that this is an advanced maternal age. This is uh, ovarian failure. This is the complicated case for us as a physician, which we need to treat and which we need to find the solution. This is the data which is coming from the UK and they are used to keep quite um, a reliable registry. And this registry is saying that every decade, age of woman delivering the first baby is increasing by two years. Meaning that if we will think about 2100, which is relatively like for not maybe for us, but for our kids, for next generation, this is relatively close. So the, the first deliveries will be happening in over 50. So the question is, either we as a physician are ready that we will not be talking about population of women over 40 whom we need to treat, but we will start talking about the population of women over 50, which uh, of course we understand the regulations, we understand that in many countries 49 is a cutoff, and again, these patients are looking about the opportunities where to travel to get a successful treatment. And, and this is the, re the regulations, but slowly, but they are changing. Uh, and the average age of the first time delivery in the UK right now is uh, 30, but every 25th birth, it's a woman over 40. So this is a reality which is uh, for, for now, and we need to, to get ready and to get prepared for this. 
We also know that if we are decreasing our chances while using uh, biological material of the patient, like own donor oocytes, the chances started to decrease and the cutoff is 35 or 36, 37. I absolutely agree. But still the implantation potential while we are using either own oocytes, which were cryopreserved before that time, or we are using and donated oocytes. So the implantation potential stays the same for any age of the woman. We are talking about the population less than 50, but this is true. We don't have a lot of experience, but we do have experience in early 50s. So still the potential for the implantation, if the patient is well prepared, is keeps to be to be high. So this is high success rate in case of usage of cryopreserved oocytes, either own or vitrified from the donor. Before we will talk about the, the strategies and the methods, let's talk about the, the oocyte. So as I understand the, 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 the attendance, this is uh, doctors, like uh, clinicians, but also we invited our patients. So I just will tell a bit about the oocyte. So this is a cell which is coming from the uh, from the ovary it grows inside of the follicles in the ovaries we can get it after we perform the um, artificial stimulation for the patient and this is quite a big cell which we can see easily under the microscope uh, you can we can see the polar body we can see the cytoplasma and cytoplasma is really important because we have very important organelles which are responsible for the function of this cell and how it's developing and how it produces the embryo later. Inside of the cytoplasma, we have mitochondria, and the mitochondria are critically important for the energy. This is like a battery for the cell. And while we are using the energy, losing the, the energy, we are losing the potential of creating a healthy embryos as well. So for the young oocyte, we have a lot of mitochondria, mitochondria and correspondingly mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this is an active cell. This is a young cell, which is, has a lot of energy. And for the aged oocyte, the number of the mitochondrial DNA levels is de decreasing. We are getting morphological changes in this mitochondrial DNA and the, the mitochondrial themselves um, and increases also deletions. Like a fact, we have the altered function and less energy from the cell. And this mitochondrial dysfunctions Bring, bring us to the lower IVF success rate, to the lower fertilization, and much higher aneuploidy rates of the created embryos in case the embryo is created. Another organelle which is very important inside of the cytoplasma of the oocyte, this is a spindle. Uh, and the spindle is responsible for the deviation of the cell division and the genetic material. So this is the most important part of the cell, which is responsible for the fertilization on the early stages of the development of the embryo and the further development until the blastocyst stage. While we are talking about normal IVF cycle for every woman, we are starting from the preparation and the, the tests to be performed to understand the strategy, the best strategy for, for the patient, how to treat her. And here I would agree, we would not stop a, a lot about the different strategies because I would say that having previous anamnesis of the patient and the treatment which has been performed and the medication which were recommended and the outcome and the trigger uh, we need to consider all this in order to define the best uh, strategy for the stimulation. Of course, we know that we need to recommend um, FSH plus LH medications. We could try different strategies like a long-term acting FSH, which is 
uh, having a boost on the beginning of the stimulation and this really helps for recruiting of more follicles. Uh, for some patients, this will not work and we would need to decide about the natural cycle and the lower levels of the FSH for the stimulation. So this part is really, really individual, but we need to find the optimal way for the stimulation in order to retrieve as many oocytes for advanced maternal age as possible, because this is a statistical data. More we have on the beginning, higher chances we have in the end while we are creating the blastocyst and we are getting into the, the, the final cycle outcome. So after we retrieve the oocytes, we have a fertilization. And as I said, and I will be talking later as well about the, the importance of the spindle, and the proper techniques being used in the laboratory and how environment is also important. And then we have the embryo cultivation. And if we are lucky during the embryo cultivation, we, we are having an embryo transfer. Again, if we are really lucky, we can have several embryos to be created and to be frozen and then to, to, to be left for the cryocycle. If we haven't achieved the proper implantation uh, result, we can retest, we can redo some tests or recommend some other tests for the patients, which hasn't been done for increasing the chances for the implantation and then consider the cryotransfer. But this is not true for many of the patients in their advanced maternal age, either after 35 or um, or even 40. So for some of the patients, we are stimulating, we are selecting the optimal regime, but we are receiving very few oocytes. Uh, we have risk that we will have a fertilization failure. We have risk that we will have no embryos for transfer. So for such patient, uh, and also the eoploidity rate, we understand and we know clearly that the abnormal embryo percentage is increasing with the age of the patient. And even if we are lucky enough to have a blastocyst, we should recommend uh, to the patient to test this blastocyst in order to be sure that we are going to, um, to maximize the chances, as we are saying on the beginning, on the clinical pregnancy rate while we are transferring euploid blastocyst to this patient. But this blastocyst could be un-euploid. So then this is a complete failure and we need to start either from the very beginning or to recommend another alternative to the patient. So one of the of the alternatives which we do recommend and which we practice in our centers, um, this is a so-called combined oocyte donation. This is program is recommended usually for those patients with their low ovarian reserve where we do expect that we would receive very limited number of the oocytes, uh, but these patients are not fully ready to the uh, standard oocyte donation. They want to try their last chance, so they will be stimulated. We will retrieve as many oocytes as possible from the patient. We will fertilize their oocytes with the partner sperm, but at the same day, in order to be synchronous with the preparation of the endometrium of the patient and to guarantee the fact that we will not lose the potential of having an embryo transfer during this cycle for the patient, we are sowing several of the donor oocytes, fertiliz fertilizing them also with the husband's sperm and cultivating separately in the different dish. And on the day of the embryo transfer, based on the clinical outcome, on the embryological outcome, on the number and the morphology of the blastocyst, we are, if patient wishes to do genetic testing, we do either the genetic testing, or if they wish to do the transfer, we are doing the embryo transfer. This gives a hope, and this gives us the potential to use the last chance for the patient, and also the psychological fact that she tried her best, we, we did the stimulation, but we haven't a, a cycle completely lost because we have an alternative as a donor embryo immediately available. So the poor equality can be uh, caused by the maternal age, 
by the genetic factors, by the endometriosis, or the fact that we the put the eggs are losing their potential. So for those patients, the most optimal treatment recommended would be the standard oocyte donation program. Some more statistic about the um, from the IHFA, and this is very recent statistic, which was published just uh, in 2022, in the end of the year, which is including the data uh, up to 2020. So they are saying that every one of every six births in uh, the UK, it's while using IVF. It's not a natural conception, but every one of six, this is uh, an IVF for the UK. They also increased significantly the, the birth rates for the patients aged 43 to 50. And they increased from 5% to 30% while using uh, donor eggs in 18, 19. So this is the data which is fully complete for the previous years. So that's why this is really the the treatment we can rely on and after we tried a lot or we tried everything with our patients we should recommend this to be to be done for this patient but in order to be effective with the OSI donation proper donor selection is very important so while we are starting from almost uh, 900 initial donor contacts we are losing one third of this after just initial consultation, after having their initial evaluation, or after they are learning about the program, or we are learning about their gynecological status, their uh, ovarian reserve, the, their health. So this is one third and the one third. Some of the donors, they will be excluded after the infection disease uh, control check, or the genetic uh, testing. So only three out of 10 candidates will become a real donor and will be able to proceed with the stimulations further. As well as this is very important to, to implement the, the good clinical practice recommendations, also to take a great care about the, the donors themselves, to educate them and to, to give them full responsibility for the program. That's, uh, these are the young women between their age of 18 to 30 with the perfect physical and the mental health consulted by the psychologist and confirmed. They are thoroughly screened. Uh, they have proven fertility. This is what is important uh, by law. So only few countries in the whole world require the proven fertility for the OSI donors. And we have done a lot of um, investigation already while comparing the data from the non-proven donors for the young students and those with no children. And the results are really different. And they have no hereditary illnesses or negative phenotypical signs, of course. So the screening includes the infection disease screening, and this is not test and the PCR and the quarantine testing after um, after the quarantine period. This is bacterial testing and the, the genetic screening, including for many, many of the donors right now, this become a routine um, ad advanced genetic testing. So the panel, not only the karyotype and the most frequent diseases, but also the genetic carrier screening panel. While we are coming to the morphological selection, we also need to share the fact that while we are working with the donors, this is different from working with the patient. So in the full cohort of the retrieved oocytes, we are getting oocyte of the different morphology. And we do graduate these oocytes into three categories. This is quality one, where we uh, check the uh, oocyte cumulus complex, zona pellucida, paravitaline space, first polar body appearance, the shape, meiotic spindle location, granulation or abscess of the granulation of the cy cytoplasm, and then we are controlling the time-lapse activities. So only those really ideal oocytes with the proper morph morphological 
findings they are selecting for the outside banking. Those with the Q2, where we see some these morphologies, like in the zona pellucida, or a little bit in the shape, or the, a little bit the granulation, they can be fertilized for the fresh cycle immediately for the embryo creation programs. And usually they have they are providing us the the good clinical outcomes and the embryological outcomes. And there is a, out of M2, there is a category of the Q3 which are not used and they are sent to the trash. So this selection gives us a lot of potential for the high clinical and embryological outcomes. And this is the data coming for last two years for frozen donor oocytes for over 27,000 uh, eggs. So we can see the fertilization rate, uh, 94%. We can see uh, blastocyst development, 74%, which is absolutely identical to the fresh oocytes. And the advantages of the availability of the vitrified oocytes is the fact that these eggs are already available. We should not wait until the donor will be stimulated. We should not synchronize the donor. Even we are using a random start a lot. So we do not, um, we understand that the follicles are sensitive in any uh, period of, of the cycle. So either this is early follicular stage or the late follicular stage or luteal stage, we are just should avoid the period of the dominant follicle and the period of the ovulation and uh, just very few days after the ovulation. In any other period, we can start the stimulation, but we need to control it properly in order to, to achieve the, the optimal outcomes. Another fact, we did a trial for 2,000 oocytes and we tested the polar body for the donor oocytes. And we, after testing, after getting the polar body biopted and sending this for the genetic testing in the lab, we freeze each oocyte as one oocyte on the straw. And we found the result that 24% out of these 2,000 2, oocytes coming from the donor between 20 to 30 years old, they came back as uneuploid. So the fact which we have seen in the table that even women in their early 30s, they have certain level of the of the aneuploidies, we confirm that fact. So we are offering also the opportunity of the NGS tested donor oocytes. So while doing this testing and freezing the egg and getting this egg as euploid, we are optimizing and we are increasing a lot a fact while the development of the uh, genetically healthy blastocyst. But of course, this uh, method would require uh, embryological laboratory to be ready to work with the NGS tested oocyte. We would need to have a special equipment to determine the spindle in order not to, to make an ICSI in the, in the not proper uh, place and then destroy the egg and having no fertilization. So this is but, but but this is true. So while even we are using a set of six oocytes, having the statistics, if this is not tested oocyte, we should expect some eggs being unemployed. And as a fact, we will be losing them during the period of the development of the blastocyst. Other advanced technologies which we are using constantly and which we would recommend to every laboratory this is the artificial intelligence time lapse um, and const contrast microscopy and GS testing. If this is um, uh, possible for the laboratory, electronic witnessing and the traceability for the whole process. This is in terms of the safety. Meiotic spindle determination. Of course, we understand that we need the polarized lights for this uh, because while we are selecting the oocytes of the Q1 morphology, we also determine the spindle. So if we cannot see the spindle for the egg, we do not select this egg as a Q1 morphology. And the recording of the light, live image during the vitrification process for each egg load. So this is how we keep the proof of the quality and the morphology of the oocyte. 
So if we are coming back to the uh, advanced maternal age and the mitochondrial activity, so maternal aging is the main cause of the impaired outcome. And it has been reported that uh, deletion 4977 in the mitochondrial DNA was commonly observed in the unfertilized oocyte or also in the oocytes from the patient of advanced maternal age. Uh, and the significant loss of the mitochondrial uh, DNA caused us the fertilization problem, early pre-implantation embryo development problem, and increases embryo aneuploidity um, as a result of the errors in the, in the meiotic division. That's why we need to take care for those patients who were unsuccessful using standard approaches about the alternatives which we may offer even for oocyte donation. And as well, this is a group of the patient who are not fully ready to accept the oocyte donation. As we know that while we are performing spindle transfer or the pronuclear transfer, we have 99% of the DNA coming from the mother and the father. We are just getting uh, DNA, which is mitochondrial DNA, which is up to 2% of the of the whole DNA, which is coming from the donor egg. So let's talk. Uh, we talked already about the spindle. Now we can talk how to determine a spindle. So only a special software with the polarized system on the microscope can determine the spindle inside of the egg cell. Um, and uh, it can be determined after we are cleaning the cumulus cells out. Um, so not every laboratory in the world can, can see the spindle and we also need an experienced embryologist or the specialists and also the high cost investment in order to be able to see this, but this is really important. So for those patients who previously had fertilization arrest or they never had blastocyst um, in, in their previous life in, in during their previous IVF cycles, we do recommend to perform the spindle transfer. So this is a replacement of the entire cytoplasm of, for the poor oocyte quality. This procedure is done on day zero. So while we are getting a donor egg and the patient egg and then exchanging the cytoplasma, leaving the DNA of the mother and then the, the nuclear DNA from the mother performing fertilization and then following the embryo development um, without special culture system, anything special like this. Um, and the pronuclear transfer, this is the procedure which is done on day one. So after the fertilization already happened, uh, and then we are exchanging just the nuclear DNA between the zygotes. So we're exchanging zygote to zygote of the donor into the zygote of the patient. We are throwing away the, the DNA from the donor egg and the patient, and then the DNA from the patient egg and the, the husband are developing in the cytoplasma, including the spindle of the donor. So we are just making an the best environment we, which is possible for the development of the nuclear DNA of the patients. Advantages of these methods are these that we are giving to the families who are affected by the serious mitochondrial diseases a chance of having a healthy children. And we know that uh, officially these methods are allowed after the they are passing the commission in the US and in the um, uh, UK. But some other countries, like it was Ukraine and like we do in Albania right now, the countries which allow experimental treatment techniques and where in the law it's written that uh, methods of IVF could be uh, used for the treating of infertility. This is where these techniques are still can be used. And this is how we practice them right now. So there is also no risk for the fertilization for the pronuclear transfer because the transfer is done already between the zygotes. 
we are getting really high blastocyst outcome for this category of the patient. And we will be talking about the category of the patient starting from 38. This was our uh, the, the youngest patient for, for this kind of technique of the treatment up to 49. So 49, this was the oldest patient for whom we received the blastocyst using her own oocytes. And then it was deployed after the hypernuclear transfer. Techniques and the mechanism of the micro manipulation requesting experienced embryologists and also the equipment. This method has been tested on human eggs and lead to the development of the blastocyst and the further clinical um, outcomes. As well as I may say, we were talking a lot about the history of the IVF. And for we all know that for 50 years ago, there was no IVF at all. And 45 years ago, that was just a miracle. And 40 years ago, that were just an individual cases, which we still didn't believe that they will really work that massive as this works right now. So that's why we think that the micro manipulation techniques, which are not allowed fully right now globally, they are our future. We can talk about the fact that we need to work with the stem cells and then to grow the oocyte from, from the stem cell. This is also our future. But right now, this is not something what we can use. Maybe we will come to that in a five, 10 year period of time. But this is something what we already use and what is effective and what we are getting as a result, as a clinical outcome for the patient. So these are just several cases. We in total we have sixty four clinical pregnancies or the, the the treatments for the patients who end up with the outcome having their genetic own embryos. Uh, of course, some of the patients will they will end up with just the donor embryos. So they will start trying and they will not get euploid blastocyst even as an end of this treatment being used. But for many, many of them, they will get a chance and they will get a pregnancy and they will get the live birth. So the first case was a 38 years old patient from China. She had been diagnosed with the mitochondrial disease. We received six major oocytes. We did a spindle transfer technique. One euploid 5AB quality blastocyst was transferred and she gave birth uh, to the healthy boy. 41-year-old patient from Indonesia, she had been diagnosed with the low variant reserve. She had 11 IVF trials before. Uh, we received just two much major X spindle transfer technique, one deployed for AB blastocyst and the healthy delivery. 39-year-old from Ukraine, uh, low variant reserve, six IVF trials with no blastocyst before. We received four major X pronuclear transfer technique to euploid blastocyst and the single birth recently. 42-year-old from UK, uh, low ovarian reserve, eight trials before without embryo transfers, two major egg pronuclear transfer, one euploid blastocyst, and the patient gave birth. So, and many, many more like this, like 44 years old, nine trials, just one major oocyte, we, I remember this patient very well. She was Ukrainian. And one major oocyte, one euploid blastocyst and healthy blastocyst and the birth uh, in 2020. So baby soon will go into the kindergarten. 32-year-old. Uh, so that was uh, uh, probably the, the youngest our patient. And she was PCOS, but she never had blastocyst before in, in her six IVF cycles. We received a good number of eggs, 21 major oocyte and eight deployed uh, blastocysts. And still she delivered a boy and she still have frozen embryos um, with us right now. And she is considering to come back for the next cycle. 41 year old, six trials, three major oocyte and one deployed blastocyst transferred. So many cases like this. And this is the data in terms of... Um, uh, oocytes which were used and the fertilization rate. So you can see that the fertilization rate is over 80% 
with the high cleavage rate, uh, blasted cyst rate after PNT, and the average age of the patient was 42.8. So this is quite an like complicated cases and the average number of cases for all patients over six. So for them, we received over 40% of the blasted cyst rate and the euploidity rate in different groups over 60%. 56 clinical pregnancy rate and 39 live birth rate so far for this data, which is immediately available. So once we are receiving an embryo, even after the uh, pronuclear transfer or the spindle transfer technique, we do recommend to make an NGS testing. And while we are having euploid embryo, we then proceed with the patient with the embryo transfer. Many of those patients who are coming just for the initial consultation, they are saying like, this is something what we would like to try as a, as our last chance, or maybe we should stop, or we were thinking already to stop trying because of this number of cases and because of all previous outcomes which we had. So number of cycles, uh, number of retrieved oocytes, IMH level, blasted cyst formation, these are the factors based on which uh, some clinicians do recommend to consider the, to the patient to stop their treatment. But we do not agree with this. Until the patient is producing oocyte, she should try it. She should try different techniques. She has a chance. If she will not produce the oocyte, so still there is an alternative as an oocyte donation if she has a if she has a uterus she has a potential for the implantation so we can work on this there is a nice publication from the israel and this is the only country in the world where the government is compensating all treatment including medications until family has three kids of their own so they were publishing a data Within four years, if patient is continuous to get treatment and unlimited number of cases, and this is also a country that they are saying and they are publishing that the the average number of K of trials uh, cycles for the patient could be eighteen. So this is extremely high even for for our experience. But after four years of the unlimited uh, treatments. 95.5% couples conceived, 89% couple gave birth to the live infant, uh, 81 achieved the live birth within the first four years, uh, and 85 within eight treatment cycle. So this is not true for many of the patients we, we see because some of them, they are ready to give up after the three, four cycles, etc. Uh, as well as this is a data from um, uh, the huge report, including over 250,000 IVF cycles from the UK. And we can see that the cumulative um, result while having more and more treatment is increasing. Of course, every treatment should be different. We should not repeat the same method and the same tendency and the same protocol and the same approach uh, every time. So that that will not probably change uh, result um, a lot. We also agree with the fact that the unexplained infertility generally means that the physician failed to find the true cause of the infertility. So there should not be a diagnosis of the unexplained infertility anymore. And if we were lucky to create a healthy euploid embryo, we should not consider only endometrium. Endometrium is always very important, of course, but we need to understand and remember that this is not a unique and the only thing which we need to consider while we are planning to transfer an embryo back uh, to the uterus. So we need to consider also the endocrine profile of the patient and the function. We need to understand the immune activity and to check carefully the immune status of the patient and also the immunology 
that was something which is regulated, very regulated in different countries. I know that not every IVF specialist can treat immunology, can understand immunology, can perform treatment. But for us, many of our patients, they become pregnant while using IVIG, while using different methods for the uh, treating their immune response. Um, error test or the wind of implantation, we have different thoughts about this, but this is something what we also got a proof that this works and we need to think about not many women will will have the cause of the moved window of implantation but um, this needs to be checked because this is an option which while we we can really lose our so important and so hardly received uh, euploid uh, blastocyst so in order to conclude, uh, we can talk about mitochondrial transfers technique that we are using them for the mitochondrial diseases treatment. They can be also used for the low ovarian reserve and the poor outcome after the previous IVF treatment. Uh, they are most effective, pronuclear transfer and the spindle transfer are the most effective mitochondrial transfer techniques because there are different also methods for the mitochondrial transfers. Um, this is required, this, these procedures, they require really good culture protocol and the practice of the mini, mi, micro manipulation from the embryologist. Uh, blastocysts which received through mitochondrial transfer technique are recommended to be analyzed by the NGS testing. Artificial intelligence is really effective and this is how we can track a lot of things and learn about a lot of things for the outside banking, but not only, also for the individual patient uh, cycles outcome. Uh, we can select the donor outside based on the artificial intelligence and this will increase the potential of the blastocyst outcome. Uh, we need to detect the spindle and the, the zona bright fringes because they are important for the fact of the avoiding cleavage arrest and um, different complications. Uh, as well as we may say that the oocyte banking is the best solution for the effective oocyte treatment, while the uh, preparation and the selection of the donors and the biological material, the oocyte itself, is performed properly. Dedicated teams of professionals should be involved in each activities. Uh, the use of the vitrified oocytes we may consider as a new gold standard for the reproduction. Individual approach is uh, highly recommended for each patient. New trends are actively uh, in the research phase and we believe that they will become a routine really soon. Uh, the most effective treatment for patients in their advanced maternal age after that they tried IVF and that was not successful is the oocyte donation. And the second opinion for these patients, complicated patients, is recommended due to the specific limits of the countries and the treatments which could not be available there as well. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, you have my contacts, you have contacts of my colleagues in case you would need any support or to ask questions. And I will be happy to, to keep our communication for the Q&A session right now and uh, keeping in touch with you also in the future. Oriana was a fantastic lecture. It was a memorable lecture that will remain in, in the soul of all the people that have attended your webinar. Uh, I was so happy, so happy to hear all the things, all the new things. And your, your, your webinar is a challenge to the mind of all people working in this field and also for patients, like you said. Uh, I want you to know that among the attendees, you have people not only from Mexico and the USA, you have people from Honduras, from Nicaragua, from Peru. So 
your voice is spreading around the world. I can promise you this. Uh, for all of them that they're watching us, uh, this lecture will remain in the YouTube of Obogene, correct? Correct. We will also send the link to everyone if you would allow us to get a list of those who has been registered but couldn't attend the webinar and also who potentially will be interested. We will send the link and also it will be in YouTube in any time for being accessed. Of course. And if you allow us, we would like to include the entire webinar into the website of the Colegio de Mexico de Reproducción Asistida. That we have a because already some people had sent me uh, chats and, and uh, uh, WhatsApps asking me if we could keep this webinar available. Uh, I like to say a few words, if you allow me, in between the things, the chats that came and, and, and thoughts that came to me. You were talking about 51 years in the year 2100. I want to tell you that a very good friend of mine, Dr. Mark Sauer, that is one of the top, top people in the United States. He's in Columbia University, he used to be in USC. In 1995, he wrote an article about 22 women that deliver after the age of 50. So it, we are not that far away. We are not that far away. So That's Mark, 200 years. <laughs> yeah, Mark already in 1995 wrote that article. It's a fantastic article. I want to ask you in the combined all site donation, that one that you combine with the own patient and the donor, do you transfer the blastocyst in the fresh cycle or you freeze or vitrify and then transfer later? We have different approaches actually for this kind of uh, program. And we always discuss all the potential and the, the results which we achieved with the patient. I can say just one clinical example Usually, we do recommend to the patient to transfer either their own oocytes, the, the blastocysts for using from, created from their own oocytes or from the donor. We do not recommend to mix them and we do recommend to test them. But as I said, like many of those patients, if they are coming already to us, they want to be pregnant a year before but not wait even until we will do the testing. So of course the patient was asking, and this was 42 year old patient. She was Ukrainian. She married a Spanish guy and they came together. She had an adult daughter. Daughter was 20 and she was my patient, just a regular gynecological patient. And she said, I will bring my mom. She need your consultation. So they came together and um, they said, we are a new couple. Husband never had kids and we would like to get a kid. So she had IMH 026. We said, like, you have a low, low chances, but let's try. We received two eggs from her. One was M1, one was M2. We fertilized both after uh, maturation of uh, M1, but one was fertilized and was developing and one was not. And she decided to purchase also four donor oocytes and we fertilized four donor oocytes. On day five, we received Morula from her one uh, major egg, and we received two blastocysts, high quality blastocysts from the donor. And she said, I don't want to wait. I don't want to test. If my embryo should not implant, it will not implant, but let's transfer to one of me and one of, of the donor. 
we said okay she signed the consent and she she went back to spain and sent us in two weeks uh, rcg test result and it was positive in two weeks she went into the uh, scan and that was twin successfully she delivered two girls and after one year they came to visit ukraine and they came to visit us in the clinic and they were sitting in the room together with the husband and they were he was saying like we were of course for us that was and this was already like a six or seven years ago that was unusual case and we said like we were curious either you would like to test like who is which which baby is from the donor egg and which is yours and the husband was so serious saying yes i will since they will stop breastfeeding i will put the the pasta and the plate with the potato and who will decide what to each what the preference i will see who is my and who is the donor uh, who is from her like from the mother and who is from the donation so that was a joke of course but uh, this is just one of the clinical cases uh, so how we can end up that even if we do not expect the clinical pregnancy from the morula and we would not even test this because technically that will be complicated to to make an ngs testing for such an embryo this embryo has a potential to implant low potential of course but still has a potential and the clinical outcome can be different so this is the answer <laughs> well there are several articles in the literature of pregnancies arising from poor quality embryos being transferred so yeah. it's not just the embryo it's not just the endometrium like you said it's a combination of many things for mm -hmm. for something to happen a, a baby like this they say it's a miracle a miracle doesn't happen with only one thing happen with many things there are several questions if you don't mind uh continuing uh absolutely uh, i tell you one says how can you improve to get all site quality since there are many pseudo imaginary protocols such as the supposed ovarian rejuvenation that has not been given any good results um, yes, in terms of the selection of the best stimulation protocol, uh, wh what is our routine or what is our standard approach? We do recommend a short protocol, antagonist protocol with uh, RCG treatment or the com uh, RCG trigger or the combined trigger. We, we used to use also combined trigger, agonist plus RCG. And the most important is to get a proper stimulation and to trigger in time in order to get the uh, cytoplasmic and the nuclear maturation for the oocyte. We understand sometimes that we are getting asynchronous growth and we need to decide which cohort of the eggs or if we have just two. So when is the best time for triggering? But this is very individual decision for all these patients. But the standard protocol, I would say, this is a short protocol with um, LH plus FSH medication uh, with the cetrotide or agonist, different type of the agonist, given since we have the follicle of 14 millimeters in the size and the trigger given on 18 plus, nine, better 19, closer even to 20 millimeters follicle. Mm, and this is a combined trigger. So this is the most common approach which we use for the patient. We used to do, and we are doing as well, the ovarian rejuvenation techniques, but this is mostly as a desire of the patient. Uh, also, I agree that what we are getting as a result of this treatment, if we are following the patient closely, we are not missing any follicle because this is how we how we act. We are measuring FSH, we are measuring IMH, but parallelly patient is coming back for the scan. And as soon as we see that we have a follicle between two to eight millimeters, which potentially we can stimulate, immediately we stimulate this follicle. 
And the outcome after the PRP uh, ovarian rejuvenation is mostly because of the of the proper controlling of the patient and the fact that she is involved also in this. Usually these patients, they do not disappear and they are in touch with the clinician and we, we are closely monitor them. And that's that's how result it is works. But but I do not really believe in the ovarian rejuvenation as as is. So Okay. Here there is a second question and and I believe they may have wanted to say something else. They said, Do you use routinely artificial intelligence in the selection of all sites? I would believe that they wanted to set embryos, but uh, I let's get it both ways. No, Do you no, use routinely artificial intelligence to selection of all sites and embryos? Yes, actually, we do. We started this last year in 2022 to use artificial intelligence routinely. And this is our like a co work which we are doing together with IVF20. And this is a great um, job done together by Birol, by our laboratory director. And I would love you as a society and as um, clinicians, you will meet with him and I would be happy to invite you and to follow all our webinars. Very often we do webinars together and I believe that this is the best also for the patient. Like we, we are talking with the patient together, me as a clinician and he as an embryologist uh, and also with the professionals because this is how we may cover all the aspects of the treatment or the techniques, the technologies, etc. So since 2022, we started to use routinely artificial intelligence for the selection of the oocyte. Before we started this, we worked for over four years with the uh, morphological selection of the oocytes as I described. We uh, defined the clear um, selective criteria for Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we teach the machine how to define Q1 and Q2, Q3. And we do this, uh, we did this manually. And now the, the artificial intelligence is, is doing this for us. So we are showing to this the full cohort retrieved from the donor and it's marking by green the Q1 oocytes, by yellow Q2 oocytes, and by red Q3 oocytes. And this is how it helps also for us to keep tracking on the efficiency, because this is a feedback for the clinician if we need to understand, to, to change something. So our aim for each stimulation is to receive over 80% of Q1 oocytes in the cohort, if that was not true for the individual case, we are taking this case for the analysis. Um, and this also helps to the embryologist to select the eggs, which they will immediately vitrify and which we can keep for the ICSI further and the embryo creation. Another question, do you use ever use growth hormone in your ovulation induction? Yes, we do. It is allowed as well, uh, like patient is signing the consent, but uh, we use growth factor for those patients in their advanced maternal age. Like many patients, they are coming to us while using this in their previous treatment cycles. Many international patients, they do so. So this is a quite a standard approach. Even we know that the Cochrane is saying this is not level A, uh, being proven, uh, but patients, as we know, they they like to try everything what is possible. So I would say that the the most I have nothing against this. Just the most important that the patient should be well checked before they are starting their IVF treatment, so that we will not do any complications for her while because. The growth hormone, it will not grow only endometrium or the, the, the follicles. It will grow everything what potentially may grow. So if, if there is something wrong, 
we need to be sure that uh, the patient is really healthy. So this is the only the only thing which we are controlling, which we are checking, and which we alerting to the patient before recommending her or approving her to to start taking the growth hormone. But yes, we do it four milligram daily during the stimulation. Probably. And of course, I, I assume that you use them in low responders, poor responders. Yes, of course, only for for those where we have very like very few follicles to grow, uh, or locally for the thin endometrium. Okay, let me see. There are some in Spanish. If there is any consequence in the live birth. After transferring embryos using the the spindle uh, transfer technique. So our data right now is this is fifty six percent clinical pregnancies, and I need to say that these are really complicated cases. So this is a a nice result, and thirty nine is a live birth. So this is very similar to the to the data as we can see from the younger population of the patient or for the population of the patient which who were transferring embryos without um, spindle transfer or the pronuclear transfer. So uh, we do not see a big difference. So if there are miscarriages, they are miscarriages related to the somatic status of the patient or the the first trimester pregnancy development but not to the embryonic factors because we've been checking the embryos we were transferring euploid embryos in all these cases so but still miscarriages happening so we understand this and we cannot avoid them for 100 percent okay we're going to stop here, uh, Uliana, because there are many other questions, but some of them repeat themselves. Uh, I want to only say that um, we have reached an agreement with Dr. Uliana that in our journal of reproduction, we will make an entire issue this year the whole journal will be dedicated to spindle transfer, pronuclear transfer, cytoplasm transfer, mitochondrial transfer, etc. Will be a whole issue, like a book dedicated to this, written by different authors. And we are already, both Juliana and myself, talking with different people that have the expertise. And uh, I think will be like a jewel in in the literature of reproduction. Uh, I wanted to tell this to everybody so they are aware, and they will be expecting. And I think probably in about six months we'll be able to to publish that, Juliana. If Absolutely. it will work as hard as. <laughs> As with Absolutely, we, we will do our best, and this is our great pleasure. You know, like talking to the professional society, we understand that some professional societies, they are really careful and they are taking care about the regulations, and they probably should do this. They, they need to follow this, but there should be a place where we can clearly state about our practical experience, what we really do and what really works, not what we should say or what we should do, but what really we do and what works. So this, thank you so much for, for this idea and we are fully supporting and uh, I believe that will be really great. Uh, the Journal of Reproduction, being you one of the editorial board members, is going to be that type of journal, as I told Valeria in her interview to me, I told her this is going to be the most democratic journal in the world in the area of reproduction. Because this is not a club of friends. This is, we want everybody to express their feelings and to tell exactly what they know. Well, we're going to finish. We have to thank you so much. I want to explain 
everybody in the world that could be watching us or listening to us that you are the typical person from Ukraine. You are an honor to your country. And we know so many people from Ukraine that are so fantastic and we are all so sorrow feeling what you are feeling. We are very empathetic with you. And the only thing we want is that this stupid war ends and we want you to return to your activities, return to your families, return to your lives, and viva Ukraine. Heroi am slav. <laughs> All the Thank best. Thank you so Anna. much. All Thank the best. Thank you so much. Thank this you. is my, my great pleasure. Thank for everyone who was with us for asking questions. For You can keep asking. So you have seen the contacts uh, Please, you can write. I'm also in your group, as I understood, in the in the um, college of the reproduction. So you can ask questions also there. And it, that will be my pleasure to come in person. I hope this will also happen this year. And we will keep our communication. Please keep your eye on what we are talking, like we are going to do a webinar soon in February with Birol Aydin together, just dedicated for the mitochondrial donation, more like a professional one from the doctor side and the embryology side. So I will be happy you will all attend um, and just all us, our activities and I wish all the best everyone. Thank you so much. All the best and please, have a good sleep now. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria, for all the help in in making this a reality. Okay. All the best. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.